Nebraska man wasn't just a mistake, but it was a fraud. Actually, it was two frauds by the scientists at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Two frauds. And it, it, whenever you're ready for that, I'd love to tell you that story. Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, host of the Weekly Worldview, science geek, Bible student, amateur comedian. Fred, it's good to be back with you talking about real science on Friday. So on today's show, we're going to hear from a renowned creation scientist on his latest research that has uncovered many new frauds in the field of human evolution. This scientist has been researching the goings-on with evolution for years, traveling around the globe, and I'm actually, I'm really looking forward to what he has to say. Did you say new frauds, Fred? New frauds? New (laughs) frauds. Evolutionary biology is the only line of work where fraud can not only enhance your career, it can also drive the entire field to new heights? Height? Drive the whole field forward? You know, I'm not really sure how I can say that, Fred, but it's definitely driving something. It's kind of like being a successful hacker, you know, doing like cyber crime. (laughs) But before we get into any trouble, okay, let's, 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 uh, let's welcome our special guest. He has no links to either cyber crime, politics, insurrection, none of that. Um... Before we do any of that, Fred, you've got to hit me with, I know the audience is on the edge of their seat, what is our interesting fact of the week? Okay, so are you ready? I, I'm ready, Fred. I have my back to the future thinking cap on. Okay, so here is the interesting fact of the week. What is the smallest known bird that begins life the size of a penny? Wait, I... A penny? All right. It begins life the size of a penny. Would that be the traditional Great Britain crown, or are you talking about a regular penny? As I (laughs) desperately... The smallest known bird. I would have to say a hummingbird, only because a hummingbird is the smallest bird I know. Well, congratulations, Doug. Good answer. I got one right. (laughs) Yes. That's two. That's two in like a month. That's great. So wow, that, it, that's yeah, a hummingbird. Record. It's a yeah, it's a super cool bird. It's the only one that can fly like a helicopter, you know, forwards and backwards. Uh, other interesting things: it has no sense of smell, but it has much better hearing than humans. It can see farther than humans, and it can see ultraviolet light. And it can travel at fifty miles an hour in a dive. Wow. Now, of course, evolutionists will say that this thing evolved from dinosaurs. And well, <laughs> okay, yeah. So we, we have our special guest. I think might have something to say about that. Well, Fred, I, I have to tell you, I had some help with the interesting fact of the week. My daughter Nicole is called the Bird Whisperer. She has how many birds do you have in your aviary right now? Thirty. She has thirty birds in an aviary that's attached to her room that she built onto our house by herself. And so I was at an unfair advantage, wow. and so she gets me the the. The Real Science Radio record of two correct answers within a 12-month period. So I want to thank my daughter, Nicole. For that. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so Nicole, your audio engineer, happened to be standing by. That's awesome. That's right. And she's, she yeah. has exposed me to the world of hummingbirds because as soon as we uh, got to, to this particular house, she hung up a hummingbird feeder. And I've got to tell you, Fred, the, the, the colors of the hummingbirds it's spectacular. They turn a different way in the light, and they're red, and then they're blue, and yeah. then they're green. It's just amazing. And they, and they dart around like little bullets. It's, it's incredible. So a God's creation yeah, is, is. is unbelievable. And so I'm so thrilled to welcome uh, our special guest. He's a longtime friend of Real Science Radio, Dr. Carl Werner. He's the author of the new book, Untold Stories of Human Evolution, Volume 3 of the Evolution, the Grand Experiment series. Dr. Warner received a degree in biology at the University of Missouri, graduating summa cum laude. He then earned a a degree in medicine, where he scored in the top 1% of the nation for all physicians on the medical boards. 
Dr. Werner has continued uh, to practice medicine, just recently retired out in St. Louis and spent years as an emergency room physician. I'd like to welcome to the Real Science Radio Airwaves, Dr. Carl Werner. Thank you. Appreciate that introduction, Doug. Great to be with you guys, and uh, I'm a real fan of Real Science Radio, and Bob Anyart was a friend of mine, so I'm just so glad to be here with you guys. Awesome. Yeah, Dr. Werner, I, I missed the last interview I believe you had with Bob. Might have been on your Living Fossil Series book, and that was such a great interview, a great book. So I'm looking forward to our audience hearing, Dr. Werner, about the latest shenanigans that you've uncovered in this murky world of human evolution. But, you know, I got to ask this question because it's really been on my mind. How in the world did you get your Ph.D. in medicine by the age of 23? That, to me, is just unbelievable. (laughs) You know, I was given a gift. I found out about a six-year medical school at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, where you get in out of high school. I found out about that. Wow in high school and my sister told me hey if you want to get in you got to do some research so i did two years of research in high school at the university of missouri and uh somehow they accepted me and i knew that i had been given a gift i was 17 when i got accepted and i was done as a physician trained 23 and you know it was the easiest school in the world it really was not harder than any other medical school and uh, man, it was a, a huge jump on my life, you know, so I could get on with other things. Wow. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, my son, Ryan, who uh, occasionally uh, sits in as a guest host here, he was trying to decide between engineer and doctor. Um, I, you know, really, I should say I was trying to decide for him between engineer and doctor. I'm like, oh, you should be a doctor. He's like, I don't want to, you know, I want to have a life before the age of 28. <laughs> Because he thought it was going to take, you know, till the, his late 20s. So he chose to be an engineer, which was a great career choice for him because he's, you know, he's doing fantastic in that field. But I just saw that in your bio. Wow, 23 years of age. That's fantastic. So, yeah, we share something in common with Dr. Phil Dennis, who's been on the show, that we both we went to the University of Missouri. I went to the School of Mines, University School of Mines there in Rolla. So not too far from Kansas City. Um, so... Before we dive into your latest work, Dr. Werner, can you kind of give us a really quick, uh, l- a little background on what got you started on your, your series, this uh, Evolution, The Grand Experiment, because you're, you're up to now three volumes. And I know this wasn't something you did over the period of like a year or, or a month. I mean, this was a, a long, you know, long-term project. It was a pizza at Minsky's Pizza Parlor on Main Street in Kansas City. I was 19 years old, I was in medical school, and a friend, by the way, I wasn't following God, and I pretty much abandoned my family and religion, not completely, but uh, basically, and a friend asked me out to pizza on a Sunday night at Minsky's Parlor, and we loved that pizza, and he asked me three questions in medical school at age 19 that just confounded me. One. Carl, you believe in the Big Bang. How could it have occurred naturally since matter doesn't form naturally because of the first law of thermodynamics? And I knew it was a great question. I I could not answer that. And I I I was there on a full ride science scholarship. I should have been able to answer a question as simple as that. I couldn't. Then he said, Carl, how could life begin in the evolutionary scheme in the primordial soup because you know as well as I, that these large macromolecules, DNA and proteins and enzymes, do not form naturally under any circumstance, any circumstance. How could life begin if DNA doesn't form, proteins don't form, enzymes don't form in the functional cell membrane? And then his third question is, Carl, how can you explain the gaps between the animal groups, like each phyla just shows up? Um, how could you explain that, given the fact that the fossil record's so rich, right now the fossil record's more than a billion fossils, he said, how could you explain that? Well, how could that even be possible? I had no answers to any of the three questions that I like, I am, uh, excuse my language, but I am, uh, and um, it's like, <laughs> wow. I, I, I thought I was such a smart person, a science person, and I couldn't even answer the most basic questions. I didn't have the answers and I just started going on this, I call it now the grand experiment. You gotta have some kind of, you know, uh, 
name for it, but it was just my mm -hmm. grand experiment. I'm going to figure this thing out because I, I had so many questions. How do you, what do you do with eight men? What do you do with dinosaurs? What do you do with the millions of years? What do you do with this? What do you do with this? And it just took me. I, I read for 18 years, and then the fall, and after those red reading years, the 18 years, then I did 27. The last 27 years, I actually performed my experiments dealing with dinosaurs, you know, living fossils, and then eight men and all that. Well, you know, Dr. Warner, you just brought up. Uh, when I when I was preparing for the show, I got to look at some of the internet forums that talk about you, and one of the accusations they make against you is that you immediately bring up questions to distract from the question of evolution, and the two questions are, uh, how could matter have formed, and how could life begin? They call those... Uh, distracting tactics. <laughs> that, a distracting. Ta How would you answer that accusation that that's a distraction from distracting tactics? That is the most important two scientific questions of our times. It's it's not as you, if you can't tell me, and you're trying to explain everything naturally. If you can't tell me where matter came from, that is so important, much more important than the fossil record. And if you can't explain, you know, the origin of life. This whole thing is is over. Let's all go home. If you, you, you can't explain these most basic things, but hey, if you agree that there's no answers, you know, Mr. Evolution Scientist, let's go on. I'll take your you you acknowledging that. Let's go on, and I'll talk now about the fossil record because it's not a distraction. You have to acknowledge this. It's very important. Yeah, and we just had uh, Dr. James Turon talking about, you know, the origin of life and how a Harvard professor admitted that it's a sham. It you is know? a sham. Uh, it is. It really is. Uh, we've had Dr. Royal Truman on, and he's gone through the, you know, the, the chemistry that's required, the processes that require actually intelligence for to do anything in a lab. So, yeah, even getting out of the gate and calling that a distraction. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> that is <laughs> And that is a distraction right there. Their point exactly. is, is distracting yeah. us from learning the truth, you know, yep. the most important truth. Well, your grand experiment books have been a part of our homeschool experience since I, Bob recommended them back well over 10 years ago. And, and we actually witnessed evolutionary fraud in the museum when... Real Science Radio and Pastor Bob and a whole group of our church kids, we all visited the Denver Museum of Alleged Natural History back in Denver in 2010. I'll link to that so folks can see and hear all about that trip. Um, it, and I think it's about 12 years ago, Bob interviewed you for your second book in the series, uh, Living Fossils. And, uh, and, and this is uh, obviously an ongoing process. And, and so has your list grown since then? Yeah, so I just released actually three books on human evolution. One is called Untold Stories of Human Evolution, which goes over all the ape men that were made out of non-primate mammals. Like this book covers the ape men that were made out of dog bones, cat bones, dolphin bones, mm -hmm. pig bones, uh, Dolphin bones. Uh, I hadn't heard about the dolphin bones. That's well, a new yeah. one. Don't, don't wow. leave that. Don't leave that out. And you know the raccoon leg bones, and the bovid like the cow bones. And so that's the third book. And then the fourth book, uh, which is simultaneously released, is nine categories of overturned ape men. There's actually 232 ape men that have been overturned. 232 species. And I asked myself, what are these? What happened to them? If they're not ape men, what are they? And I divide them into nine groups. Well, some were monkeys, some were apes, some were uh, recently buried humans, some were remotely buried humans, some were, you know, um, uh, other types of animals, some were uh, anim uh, bones that have been altered. And I basically divided them into nine groups. So you could say, whatever happened to the, that ape man? Whatever happened to that ape man? Whatever happened to that ape man? So that's just released. And then the last book in the series on human evolution is my 432 page bibliography. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. You know, well, uh, just your series leading up to that, I did want to comment on this because, you know, Bob really loved his list shows. And one of the list shows that we added was Living Fossils. 
In fact, you can see that list at rsr.org slash living dash fossils. And anyway, you know, Dr. Werner, your grand experiment series in and of itself to me is a national treasure. It's so encouraging to hear that, you know, Doug used it in his, for his homeschool. I highly encourage parents, if you're homeschooling, if you're sending your kids to Christian schools, have them add that to the curriculum. To me, it's it's really one of the, if not, the, it's probably the top resource, in my opinion, for homeschoolers. Uh, if it's not the top, it's in the top three. And, you know, we carry it in our store for a reason. Bob and I, we're always meticulous about what we have in our store. And you can get his first two volumes, and we're going to add his third volume to our store. These, these books and the DVDs, they're professionally edited. They, they've got great photography, fantastic photography. They've got videography, some of it underwater, and it had to take many, uh, many trials and errors, to, to, but it, it's so beautiful. It's amazing that you're able to accomplish that. So, you know, one takeaway for me, Dr. Werner, on your Living Fossils series was just this whole thing with all these mammals that they find in the dinosaur layers uh, that people don't know about. They go to the museum, we talk about deception in the museums, but they see dinosaurs, but they're not shown the animals that live with them. For example, like uh, parrots, uh, flamingos. Now, if I'm not mistaken, those are birds. I thought dinosaurs were supposed to evolve into birds, and yet they find them to, with dinosaurs. To me, that's a great illustration of really the deception that happens in evolution and the deception. misleading of the public. Uh, yeah, yes, it's deception. deception. Yep. Yeah, and and you know, like like you said, how many people have gone to a museum and seen a a duck sitting on the back of a T Rex back? But that is true. They did find ducks in the same layer, the Cretaceous layer, with the T Rex, and yet they never display them together. Now, same with a you know a possum. Same with. Um, uh, you know, a boa constrictor, same with uh, iguana, all these normal animals, they never place next to the dinosaurs to create the illusion of evolution, that something was different in the mm -hmm. past. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, interesting. When we did our Man in the Street interviews at Cherry Creek Mall, one of the people said, you know, their evidence for evolution is, you know, the fossil record. Where so many people will say, well, what about the fossil record? Well, I like what you say. Well, let's look at the fossil record. Yeah, and that's yeah. novel. <laughs> That's yeah, novel. Yeah. Let's actually look at it and see what it says, you know. A yeah. thousand bats, uh, bat fossils, and yet not a single example of a bat ancestor. I mean, there's so many more examples yeah. that your books get into all of this stuff. And, and now you've uncovered, you know, a lot of the frauds that are happening in human evolution. Um, in fact, I think you mentioned before the show in an email something like 150 frauds. We're not talking yep. two or three like Piltdown and Nebraska Man. I mean, you've got all kinds of documented frauds of human evolution that I'm looking forward to uh, us getting into with your latest research. Yeah, and I want to tell the audiences that I'm not using the word fraud lightly and mistakenly. Mm -hmm. I'm using it as an intentional, knowingly misleading your listener or your viewer. And so uh, a fraud would be um, that you altered a fossil and there's no justification for it and you hid the fact that you altered it. Or a fraud would be that you planted an ape man. Um, but like in the past, the Nebraska man wasn't a fraud because the Nebraska man was just, they mistook a pig tooth as an ape man. But that wouldn't be a fraud by my definition of fraud. But it turns out Nebraska man was a fraud. And this is something, um, it hadn't been known until for 102 years it slept in the books. And Debbie and I uncovered this, that Nebraska man wasn't just a mistake, but it was a fraud. Actually it was two frauds by the scientists at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Two frauds. And it, it, whenever you're ready for that, I'd love to tell you that story. Yeah, I wasn't aware that there was a fraud Underneath the fraud that I thought of just saying that a, a tooth, a pig's tooth, is somehow you're able to create art, artistic renderings of an ape man and his family from a single tooth. I mean, that's all yeah. I've ever known a Nebraska man. And that enough in of itself is to say, you know, this is nonsense. It is nonsense. And I would call it 
overzealous scientist where he comes from a pig tooth and gets up to a drawing of an ape man. I still call that not fraud. I just like stupid. I'd call it, you know, overzealous, a big mistake, you know, especially these scientists that did it were they wrote books on the evolution of mammal molar teeth. They were the world's dental experts. They should have figured this out. But I still don't say that's a fraud. But what we uncovered, you all have never heard before. And this is the most incredible fraud. And it's also, it was anti-Christian bashing and it was anti-creationist bashing all together. Fraud, anti-Christian, anti-creationist. And whenever you're ready, I want to tell you that story. And this is all around Nebraska, man? Yes, it is. The, the fraud is around Nebraska, man. There's two frauds by the scientists at the American Museum of Natural History. Again, you have never heard this before today. So here, you want to hear the story? Here it is. Nebraska man was announced in 1922. Remember that year, 1922. And it was actually, it turned out to be an eight man tooth. I mean, a pig tooth. And they admitted that four or five years later, yeah, we made a mistake. Oh, it bad us. We, it, we identified a pig tooth as an ape man, but it was not a mistake. It was fraud. Now remember, they announced it in 1922. Go back 14 years, 1908. These same scientists that announced the Nebraska man in 1908 are at the same dig site and they find what? A pig jaw. And they notice, look in the pig jaw. This is a strange that the premolar teeth of the pig jaw looks like molar teeth of humans and of apes. Scientists beware because we realized this in 1908 that pig teeth look like human teeth or ape teeth and they could easily be mistaken as an ape man. That was published internally in a very small uh, journal in the museum. Nobody probably read it, no vitiates. It was buried in a little small paragraph. Wow. Then wow. fast forward from 1908 to 1916. 1916, guess what they find? They find another pig tooth. And they say, hmm, that's kind of strange, another pig tooth. Not, nothing really to make of it. Let's just put it on the shelf, not even bring it to the museum. Just put it on the shelf because it's of such little consequence, okay? So that tooth that they just put on the shelf is going to become the Nebraska eight-man tooth. Now, in 1920, Williams Jennings Bryan, he was a former Secretary of State mm -hmm. under Woodrow Wilson. He was a... Yep congressman from Nebraska, and he has been portrayed in the media as a buffoon because he was at the Scopes trial and the media portrayed him as a buffoon. But he was no buffoon. He was articulate. He was smart. He was charismatic. When he spoke at these gatherings, and you can see pictures of this in my book, tens of thousands of people would show up. And when you read his articles, which are published in my book, they're very well written. They're very articulate. And he would say things like, you know, if you want to believe that your relatives are apes and monkeys, fine, go ahead. But there's just not enough evidence for it. So in 1922, William Jennings Bryan had the audacity to write an op-ed piece for the New York Times. It was a full page op-ed piece criticizing the theory of human evolution, saying that human evolution turns the Bible into a scrap of paper. But he had the audacity at the end of the article to say, I challenge the president of the American Museum to respond to this. And so now the president of the American Museum, Henry Fairfield Osborne, is really PO'd. He has to respond to this crazy creationist and he has to work on this. He has to write up an op-ed piece and so the next week he gives kind of a soft, you know, uh, response, you know, da, 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 and the evolution's true, da, 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 da. And um, amazingly, six weeks later, or four weeks later, he announces they had, they just found an ape man in Nebraska. Now, what he is announcing is the tooth that was found, you know, six years earlier. Now, it gets better than this. And he says the tooth was found just last year. You see, what they did is they pulled a pig tooth off the shelf 
and they said, uh, William Jennings Bryan, you're an idiot. You're a buffoon. Look at you have an ape man in your own backyard in Nebraska. We just found this ape man. Mm -hmm. It's the ape man of the Western world. And uh, how could you not look at the evidence? And it kind of did oh, silence. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it kind of did silence William Jennings Bryan. You know, he said, I don't believe it's an ape man, but you know, what do you, I don't have the expertise and you're the dental experts. And no one knew that this was a fraud job, a hack job, and an anti-Christian job. And this president of the American Museum then went on to write a book called The World Speaks to Brian. And he basically said, you know, you're a Christian, you're a type of person we need to silence. You're, a, you know, you believe in the Bible and this and this. And this is a president of the American Museum who's actually fraudulent. And there's a yeah. great ending to this story, if, if you don't mind me just telling the ending. Sure. Three years later, the American, or let's see, in 1927, the American Museum announces that Osborne, the president, is abandoning the theory of human evolution. What? what? Yeah, he wrote an article in Science saying, quote, let us abandon the ape to man theory. And he said, this is this is a guy that found the pig tooth, by the way. He basically says, you know, the Nebraska, I mean, Neanderthal man's not a good enough proof. And so same with Pithecanthropus or Homo erectus, it's not a good proof. Well, it just doesn't fit. Everything doesn't work. So let's just abandon the idea that humans evolved from apes. It was probably some other kind of animal. <laughs> How's that for an ending of a big fraud story? <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's wow. amazing. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, I have a little bit of a connection here in this in the in this regard. So I never realized it never occurred to me that William Jennings Bryan, he's from Nebraska, and I knew that really well because my great 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 grandfather won the Medal of Honor in the Civil War for trying to kidnap Jefferson Davis. He was going to be William Jennings Bryan's Secretary of State when he ran for president. And I think it was against McKinley. So yes. there's this whole Nebraska connection. My grand, great, great, great grandfather was from Nebraska, and so was my grandfather, who huh. you know descended from him. So that's I, it. Never occurred to me that they took that they they had this t fossil tooth from Nebraska to discredit this man that unfortunately worked for a period of time. I mean, it sounds yeah. like it, it had worked, a, a, it worked in, it, until William Jennings Bryan died, thinking that you know, they still were claiming it. So he, he died yeah. just after the Scopes trial. So yeah, it silenced him kind of, you know, he, he wasn't easily silenced, but it did shut him up and they always had a good argument to get him. Look at your backyard. You got eight men yeah. in your backyard, wow. you know. That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. And, and so it, it's interesting to look back a hundred years, right? And realize that this effort to silence Christianity by throwing out giant big claims that will capture the media attention and keep everyone's mind off of investigation. This has been going on for a century or more. Since well, Darwin's time. For, since Darwin's time. I, yeah, I, yeah. I submit it's been going on since ma the fall of man. Things don't change under the sun. Uh, yes, it's, I agree. This, you know, the spiritual warfare that Dr. Werner, you and I were talking about off air, it's just, it's so prevalent. Uh, and here's just a classic example that behind the scenes with this whole Nebraska man thing, I wasn't aware of that. Wow. Yes. Hmm. Now, men, I just want you to realize that was two frauds. I still have 148 to go. I hope we have a long show here. That was just two. And yeah. I, I'm telling you, you will have never heard of you. No, you, 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 you will only heard of a couple of these. Uh, you know, the Piltdown, but I have 146 others you've never heard of, and they're just as big. They're just as astounding, and I can't well, wait to tell you the next one if you have time, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny that, you know, you've got 150, and most creationists like myself, I know of a handful. You know, we've had Brody Leach on. He's kind of our eight-man expert. He's done shows on the Smithsonian Hall of Origins and just the shenanigans they pull there with you know creating eight men out of fragments of bones but uh that's kind of where we're at with this so i'm excited to hear more and i know our audience is too some of these other frauds i mean excited but at the same time just flabbergasted and just shaking our heads at the spiritual warfare that goes on uh-huh uh-huh well, like but, but we have to be aware we have to be aware if we're going to uh 
if we're going to try to counteract this. And but now we're probably running out of time for our radio audience in Denver. We're probably coming up to the end. So if you want to hear more from Dr. Carl Werner, you can probably go to KGov. We'll probably have a little bit more there. And then, Dr. Werner, if you'll join us again, we would love to have you back on the air to uh, tell us some more and, and reveal some of these frauds that we may not have heard about. I would love to. get Schedule me for 14 more weeks. <laughs> <laughs> And in that 14 weeks, you'll probably come up with another 30 or 40, and your list will go to near 200. Oh, shoot. <laughs> it would be really nice if we had a guy in the studio who could come up with a fraud right, right off the top of his head. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I let's do one more about, fraud. I want to tell you about one more fraud, man. Yeah, this let's do is, one more fraud, and then we're, what we're going to do is let's do one more fraud. Then we're gonna we're run, we're out of time for uh, this week's show. We'll do one more fraud, and then we're going to continue next week because there, I just there's so much, so much more to get to. Yes. This is the, the stuff you're uncovering, and I want to reiterate to the audience: Doctor Warner doesn't do this in a vacuum. He's been around the globe, literally. You know, uh, he's been scuba diving at the Great Barrier Reef. He's been interviewing these scientists who are secular evolutionists uh it this is this is all stuff that's been done over many years like over a decade right dr Werner? i think probably at least 15 years just to do your first book yeah and this book this what i'm telling you now is the last 27 years of filming we filmed oh, this wow. series over the last 27 years so it takes a while to get to the bottom of it and uh you know it is what it is it just you, you can't do it in a week let's just put it that way yeah. So let's go ahead and do one more fraud, and then we're going to bring you back next week. You know, Richard Leakey in 1984 found the Turkana boy. And Debbie and I traveled uh, to Kenya, and we filmed the original fossils of the Turkana boy. And you could see this in our book, Volume 4. And... When I looked at the Turkana boy, it was strange. I had never seen this in the copies of the fossils at the museum, nor had I ever noticed a problem in photographs of the original fossil. But when I got there to the museum and we photographed it, or Debbie photographed it, it was strange. The skull was split on the sideways right here, and the frontal part was pulled forward. Then, it was split here with filler, and it was split here with filler. When I got home and looked at that picture and compared it to Richard Leakey's monograph on the Turkana boy, I realized he's altered the photograph. <laughs> he altered the mm. photograph. And how do I know that? If you go to my book, volume four, here's your Turkana boy, and here's the photograph, our picture and his picture, and they don't match up. He painted in where fossils were missing, but he only painted in the areas he wanted your eyes to be drawn to. He didn't paint mm. in the split, the split, and the split. And the Leakeys have a family history of moving faces. They've done this three times now, where they want to make it more ape-like, they'll push it out, and want to make it more human-like, to push it in. And this was one of those where he pushed it out. They're kind of boys six feet tall. He's basically a human, but they pushed the face out. And I contacted Richard Leakey right before he died and said, Richard, what's going on with this? It, it, the face doesn't look like it's in the right position. It looks too far out. And what's, why did you paint the photograph white? I don't understand that either. Was it white at one time? Which, which makes no sense. <laughs> I'm sorry. His answer, his answer on the email, and you can read this. In the book, on volume four in the bibliography, I got the whole emails written out. He says, yeah, it's wrong. Wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, this is, now he, he's saying the, uh, that would also mean every copy in every museum of the Turkana boy skull is wrong because they copied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And basically, he moved the face out. And then as we dug into this more, and if you watch this on our video series, which you can watch online, um, through our website, you can actually see it. Step one, step two, step three, and he's moving it out. And then you can see how he changed the photographs 
And wow, did you just do that? So that's yeah, one that's, more. That's incredible. Now I just did three frauds for you. Now we got 146 new frauds to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's incredible, Dr. Warner. What's, what's the website? You mentioned your website. We'll put up a link. Thank you. You can see the videos and also order videos from thegrandexperiment.com. There's no spaces, thegrandexperiment.com. Okay, and yeah, we'll provide a link for that uh, in the show notes and on the uh, video for those watching on YouTube. So, Dr. Yeah. Werner, we are out of time. We're going to definitely have you back next week. I'm great that you're willing to come back and continue through these frauds. We probably won't do all 146, but we'll get to oh. some of the highlights. <laughs> We'd like to. But like you said, we might have to do like another 15 shows in a row. So um, so anyways, uh, looking forward to that. Uh, again, thank you for coming on today. So for Dr. Carl Werner and Doug McBurney, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you. <laughs>